Hi, I'm John DeSteiger. I'm the president of Oklahoma Christian University. We have a very, very special guest on campus. Chris Heron is here. He's going to speak to some of our student athletes here just a little bit. His is a story that is powerful and important. Chris, thanks for being on campus with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, I want to go back years ago to your high school days. You were a high school basketball phenom, and you came from a family of basketball players. I did. I um, All the way down to my great-grandfather, Durfee Basketball, where I grew up in Florida, Massachusetts, was a rich in tradition, um, pride, and uh, Durfee Basketball was actually the first sellout of the Boston Garden to sell the Boston Garden out. And that's when Bill Russell and Bob Cousy played. I understand also that in the history of Massachusetts, only three high school players have been all state three years in a row. Mm -hmm. Your older brother, yes. Patrick Ewing, and you. Yes. That's, a, that's incredible. It's a cool company. Yeah, yeah, very, very cool. So after high school, recruited by several major colleges and universities, you chose Boston College. Why, why did you decide to, to stay in Massachusetts? I was a local kid and I wanted to stay home. I also had a great relationship with Coach O'Brien, who had been there for a few years and actually recruited my brother to go to Boston College. It just felt right at the time. You know, hindsight, looking back, uh, it would have been nice to get away and grow up a little bit, but it's all in the plan. Right. You were there for a year, you were injured, and you went to Fresno State. You had a very good career at Fresno State. Uh, you were drafted in the second round by the Denver Nuggets. You played a year for Denver, then you went back to Boston and played for the Celtics. I did. Uh, and you also had several other pro teams internationally that you played for following your time in the NBA. Uh, in a lot of ways, Chris, that sounds like just a, a wonderful um, storybook life. But there were difficulties. Major difficulties. You know, I, I was untreated. Uh, I had been struggling with substance abuse since I was about 18 years old. And I carried that burden with me along the way throughout my professional basketball career, you know, which today I'm extremely grateful for becoming a professional athlete and I can look at it in, in a positive way today because it's given me a forum. It's given me an opportunity to speak um, and, and share my story where eight years ago I was extremely embarrassed about my accomplishments. Mm -hmm. I, I've read a couple of quotes that have been attributed to you one is, and you were speaking about addiction mm -hmm. and substance abuse, you said, this will never happen to me. But it did. It sure did. Uh, you know, at 18, 20, 21, you never believe it's going to happen to you. And honestly, at that time in my life, um, cocaine was the substance. And it wasn't that I was an everyday user. It would probably be once every couple of months. But when I used it, it was in abundance, and I had, a, had difficulty stopping. So I didn't see this huge issue for myself when it was just a once every couple of months deal back then. Looking back today, it was a huge problem. Mm -hmm. You know, anytime an 18-year-old, anytime anybody's doing a drug that can kill them, it's a problem. But back then, I, I was naive. There's another quote. When you were playing for the Celtics mm -hmm. uh, in Madison Square Garden, the quote uh, that I understand, and by the way, you spent your childhood growing up playing hours and hours and hours on the basketball court at home and other places, and your dream was to become a, an NBA player, a Boston sure. Celtic. And the quote was, once I got there, I couldn't care less. Had, had drugs gripped you that much? You know, I often say that I was a professional athlete. I was a professional basketball player two hours a day, and I was a professional drug addict the other 22. It's an all-consuming illness. You know, my priority when I woke up in the morning was to, was to be well, was to not be sick. Uh, so whatever got in the way of that, you know, I went around it. And basketball got in the way of my drug addiction. You know, again, it's, it's one of those issues where you look at and all those hours in the driveway did not go unwasted, you know? Mm. They didn't. At one time in my life, I thought they did. But that hard work paid off, uh, not on the basketball court, but in what I do today. Chris, something very special happened on August the 1st, mm -hmm. 2008. What, what was that? August 1st, 2008, my son was born. My son, Drew, and who's now six years old, and we celebrate together my, my anniversary of recovery, which is 
uh, I just recently celebrated six years sober. And that's something I take great pride in. And out of all the records that I've, I've held or broken, that's the one that I hold near and dear. You know, for six years consecutive, I haven't had a need to put a substance in my body. No day was too good or too bad to change it. And that's something that I take great, great pride in. Wow. Can you tell me, was it, was it seeing your son being born? And he was, he was your third, I mm -hmm. believe. Yes. Was it a conversation with somebody? My counselor at the treatment center, um, I relapsed. And when I went home, shortly after my son was born, he told me I should play dead, that, that I should never contact my family again. And they were better off without me and I should start to let them live. And when he said play dead, I always, I had thoughts of that myself. I should just get in the car and just disappear. I had never really heard anybody say it out loud. And when he said that, I remember like it was yesterday, I walked out of his office in tears and went back to my room in the treatment center, dropped to my knees and I started praying and I've been sober since. Well, w what you're doing now is pretty amazing. Thank you. Uh, you have a, a business that you are actively involved with young people today. Sure. Uh, I think that's Hoop Dreams with yeah. Chris Heron. Yeah. Outstanding things. And you also spread this message that you have that, that there is hope sure. and recovery. It sounds like you're doing really, really great things with your life. You know, it's, um, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to have another opportunity and I don't take that for granted. And, um, and I'm gonna do the best I can with it. And sharing my story, there's a stigma attached to addiction. And, and if I can break that stigma for somebody and, and say, well, if he can, I can, then that's what it's all about. Drug addiction is an illness and it deserves to be treated like one. It's something that you need to, to address and treat. So, you know, that's why when I go on college campuses, sometimes it's difficult because Half the campus will tell you it's a medical issue, that it's an illness, and the other half will treat it punitively. Mm. So it's, it's a contradiction, in a sense. Um, and, and I think that's why a lot of people run away from telling it and don't want to share their struggle because they're afraid how they will be judged in the end. What is the advice? Is there a, is there a, a, a nugget of advice that you want to make sure that your audience hears and understands while they listen to you? There's so many messages kids can get out of this. Most kids sitting in front of me today at Oklahoma Christian will not be drug addicts. Probably all of them, but they might have family members and they might have a more empathetic view once they walk out. And they might, they might walk out unafraid to approach it and to talk about it and to address it. You know, my mom made me be an altar boy when I was a kid and I used to struggle with that. And, uh, and then I found out why. I found out when I was 32 and I had no place left to turn. And once I turned in that direction, life changed. If it wasn't for my faith, I wouldn't be here. I wish I had it a little earlier. It was always there, I just never, I never tapped into it. Chris, any, any final message to, uh, to the audience or the camera? I just look forward to, to having an opportunity to, uh, to talk to the athletes on this campus. You know, it's a responsibility that I, I don't take lightly and it's a big deal. It's a big deal when someone has faith in you to step in front of 200 young adults to inspire them or, or to help them. And, and that's what I try to do. Mm. Well, God bless you. We're so glad that you're here. Thank we you. know that you have changed lives in other places. And my guess is you will change lives here tonight as well. And by the way, I love your accent nice. as well. We yeah. don't hear that as often might, here in Oklahoma. <laughs> you might need subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Heron. A life story of hope and difficulty and promise. God bless you. Thank you, Chris, very much. Thank you. Uh -huh.